afternoon all. I would like to show you a very interesting game by Alexander Beljavsky, played in the Tilburg tournament of 1981, which Alexander did exceptionally well. He interrupted basically uh, Anatoly Karpov's long run of and tradition of winning the Tilburg tournament. Well, there were a few other people that won Tilburg, but Karpov dominated this series of events. Uh, so in this 1981, though, things were different. Alexander Beljavsky was playing white against Bent Larsen, the great day, and he kicked off with e4. Larsen chose the Karakhan defense, a reputation for being very solid. So d4, d5, and we see that the main uh, line variation, knight c3, black took on e4, knight takes e4, and let's move bishop f5. The knight goes back, the bishop goes back, and this is all theory h4. So white's gaining a little bit of space, driving the bishop back even further soon, but black enjoys a solid and flexible position, even though black is usually occupying just the first three rows in this variation. So we see now h6 after knight f3, knight d7, and the black bishop being pushed further back, all theory, and now white exchanges off the light square bishops with bishop d3. So here we see knight g f6, and although black is on the first three ranks, black has a solid position that maybe sometimes looks forward to playing c5, for example, as a thematic plan. We see now the move bishop f4. Often in this position, another alternative which is often seen is the move bishop d2. Okay, but bishop f4 does have some advantages to it. It deprives the queen of the c7 square. The queen, of course, could go to b6 and black could still legally castle with castling queenside if black wanted to castle queenside. Okay, castling queenside is sometimes a good option for black rather than trying to castle kingside. For the moment, this move looks quite reasonable, what Larson played here. e6, white castles queenside. And again, there's an opportunity maybe to make use of the queen. We'll check this out in the second pass, but it seems queen b6 or maybe knight d5, trying to just exploit that bishop being on f4. These might be viable alternatives, which we should really check out in the second pass. Bishop e7 was played here. And now we see knight e5. And now we see an aggressive looking move from Bent Larson. But um, maybe it was important to kick this bishop with knight d5 or to, to play queen b6 or maybe even to take. We'll check out the alternatives, but a5 was played here. And now after rook h e1, well, white seems to have pressure building up. Does black actually want to castle kingside here? Would it actually be quite dangerous in this particular position? Black did not castle kingside, he played instead a4. And here we see a remarkable move played by white. Can you spot what Alexander played in this position? If I give you 10 seconds starting from now. Okay, well, just to find the rook, which has been placed on e1 as well. The move knight g6 was played, which hits the rook and the bishop. Is this some sort of trap from black? Did black want this move? What does it actually do? Well, immediately it could win two pawns. Intuitively, it wins two pawns with, say, this. And is that dangerous? To assess how dangerous this is, well, we could think we can also make use of the f5 square. We can also double rooks. The king being here is, is trapping in the rook. 
But we'll check in the second pass this position, if it's so dangerous as it initially seems. It seems white is in the position to exert more pressure on e7 for sure in that e file. This knight f5 in particular looks a bit menacing, hitting g7 as well as e7. So Larson perhaps didn't like the look of that, and he played knight d5 now, hitting this bishop on f4. So does this knight want to take that rook and potentially be trapped there after the knight takes f4? Maybe that's going to be okay for black. So for example, just a very quick check here. And this, and this is, there might be a, a very clever move like queen h7 though, trying to do something with the knight. We really need to check this out, but maybe just knight f6 here and it gets a bit hairy. Okay, something for engines to check in the second pass of this game, for sure. So white though had a different idea in mind. Alexander, in this position, piles the pressure on with knight to f5. Look at this. These knights are hitting e7. Now if knight takes f4 that would be rather embarrassing. I don't think we need to engine check this one. Knight takes g7 would be mate. Ouch. So that's not an option. E takes f5 doesn't look too palatable just intuitively. Maybe just knight takes e7. Well, then there could be even stronger moves to check out here. Okay. So both knights are hanging. F takes g6 needs to be checked out as well. There's a lot to check out here tactically. What is going on here? Okay. In the second pass, we'll go through these. For the moment, in this position, Larson tried to sidestep all of this stuff after knight f5. He simply retreated the bishop to f8. But now we see the move bishop d6. Still, if the bishop takes, then knight g7 against mate, so not too many options for black. For Black has to be careful here. He's under severe pressure. He safeguards the g7 pawn though with rook g8, as though bishop takes d6 might be on the cards without being mated. Now more pressure though is coming black's way. With that king in the centre, this looks like a vivid example already of the dangers of leaving the king in the centre. We see the move c4. The knight moves to b4, attacking the queen. The queen now goes to h3. Iron e6 from the diagonal. Is there a major sacrifice on the way? For example, knight takes g7 and rook e6. That looks pretty dangerous. Well, in fact, black now took some material with f takes g6. Look at all white's pieces. Ready. Apart from the rook on d1, everything else is ready to go for the black king. Rook takes e6 check, king f7, and now can you spot the move which Alexander played in this position? If I give you 10 seconds, starting from now. Okay, I know it looks like a horror of a chess game. h takes g6, just offering the rook, bringing the king to e6. King takes e6, and now we see rook e1 check. And this looks like a valid defensive resource in the circumstances. To give the king an escape path, knight e5 is played, just offering the knight to, to try and run with the king, maybe. The king is not going anywhere. Bishop takes e5. And Larson believes it is time to resign now in this position. What a crush. Visually, anyway, 23 moves. Let's check this out technically now. Okay, this final position 
in this final position. What can black do if king d7? It's amazing too. Knight takes g7 check. So the king goes to e7. Queen e6 is mate. Let's go back. So if not king d7, if a knight tries to just delay things, does it matter? Just king b1 best. Knight takes rook takes e5. King d7. And again we have this now in this position, knight takes g7, check, and then we can win the queen with knight e6, check. It doesn't look too good, and white will be winning that one. So this final position, it doesn't look as though it's very good, to say the least. So let's go back. So we saw the Karakhan, and this is all theory so far, pretty standard. So the two moves, bishop f4, bishop d2, which the engine kind of likes both of these, to try and castle maybe queenside in both lines. So we see bishop f4, e6, perfectly okay so far for black, white castles queenside. Now here, <clears throat> bishop e7, is it seems to be okay, technically. Knight e5. But here knight d5 is implied. Maybe black should try knight d5 just to kick that bishop. So let's have a quick look. Would that keep the evaluation down? The bishop goes back to d2 and we're sort of transposing into a normal line. Maybe black can castle, or maybe just even take on e5 here. Then queen c7 to try and castle queen side maybe. So this doesn't look initially too bad anyway. Unless this is a danger line for black, it might be okay to castle here. Although it looks a bit dangerous always to castle king side with uh, white having space there. White well, might be better there, but um, it's an interesting thing uh, to consider knight d5, a forcing move here, just on that bishop being on f4 in this position. Maybe queen c7 is less committal with c4. Just go back and have bishop f4. We might have bishop d6. And again, black should be maybe okay here, challenging that e5. Okay, so a5 was played. Now, after rook he1, things are starting to get um, dangerous already. Let me show you sorry, more of the engine uh, line here. It's about equal round here, and we see a4 perhaps making things a little bit more dangerous. In fact, the engine really likes the move knight g6 in this position. So, well, if black wanted to keep safe, just castling, maybe king side is better. And then, then a4, and there wouldn't be so much trouble with knight g6, at least. So one move here with the king in the center a bit too long and we see knight g6. This is something to bear in mind from the, from the white side for one's opening repertoires. So what is going on here? Well, if fg, queen takes, king fa, rook takes e6, queen e8. Now in this position, even though this looks good to evict the queen, Apparently we can still just pile up the pressure and leave a pawn on g6. And this knight f5 is going to be scary. Knight f5 coming up. I mean say say we give black um Okay, let's play knight g eight. Well rook takes e seven here, for example. And this this looks hopeless because of knight f5 coming up. So e7 is going to be pulverized if black's not careful. If if the bishop leaves e7, okay, then we're in trouble again, aren't we? Because okay, say the bishop leaves the diagonal here, check. The knight f5 is threatening now rook e7 to g7. That's hopeless for black. And if we follow the engine line purely here, knight d5 to counterattack, 
on f4. Okay, bishop d2, bishop going back. Knight f5 again. And what is the threat here? What is the threat? It's um, it's quite a few pawns. Well, it's two pawns, isn't it? Four, five, six, seven, three, four, five for the piece. So let's go with b5. Well, we could win c6 there, right? Let's try not to lose material. Let's play this. C4, not minding the exchange of bishops here. Knight goes away from e7 a bit. And we get rook takes f6 now, showing more tactical vulnerabilities for black with the king on f8. That's a disaster. So it seems disasters are actually imminent in various ways here in this position. On b5, rook e7. It seems that e7 squares used even here, even though seemingly protected. Knight takes, rook takes. Forking d7, g7. Black tries to defend with rook a7. Check. Check. This is starting to look brutal. Knight f5 now threatening. This this pawn looks ready for action. So this kind of scenario looks as though there's going to be rook f8 on the cards or something like that. Bishop g5 check. Let's see where this is heading. D takes c5 because of rook f8. Knight d4. It's a huge advantage for white here. Seems black is just discoordinated in this position. Both sides of the board, these horrible passports, and that rook f8 being forced through after that in this in this variation. So it seems there's really crushing implications we're seeing all the time now from this concept. This this knight sack, this initial knight sack, seems to justify itself in in various different tactical ways. So in the game. Uh, we saw actually Bent Larson play knight d5. And now more pressure with knight f5. By the way, if knight takes h8, I assumed black was okay, but uh, queen h7 is not the strongest. There's actually king f8 here. King f8. And that should be a Mm, on a certain depth about equality so instead though Queen f3 might be okay for white but um I think the game continuation was even stronger this is the recommended move he played a Houdini move Knight f5 back in 1981 Alexander's playing Knight f5 so he doesn't mind Knight takes f4 of, of course Knight g7 is mate there um now what does he do here? If he takes this, knight takes g7 is actually a mate in three, taking these two pawns, and it's mate next move because of queen g6. So that's no good. Ouch. So knight f5 is a really, it's a bone crusher of a move. Bishop f8, and now, okay, the continuation here was bishop d6 threatening if nothing else well to take and then maybe knight takes g7 so rook g8 was played what else is there black is running out of moves if he if he takes here another it's a mate in four knight takes g7 if takes queen g6 is mate because that bishop's going across the diagonal from d6 to f8 if king f7 queen g6 knight e6 the mating wow so okay it's not good to take that knight so rook g8 and then we saw c4 just casually playing c4 with all this pressure there on black knight b4 queen goes to h3 f3 is apparently good as well but queen goes to h3 Now f takes g6 is played. It looks pretty dire for black whenever it's played in this position. So fg 
and we saw rook takes e6 and now is the engine going to find Alexander's move sacrificing the rook yes it really really likes h takes g6 check as depth 16 plus 26 <laughs> hg6 king took check knight e5 virtually forced you might wonder just briefly king f6 as an alternative as a mate in five knight g3 threatens queen e6 and queen f5 here so after a token check or two how would black defend queen f5 uh, the, the engine is just doing desperate checks let's not bother that so king f6 is not playable so knight e5 well black could resign here but say uh, plays on well I, I didn't I don't I'm not sure he played on here actually this is engine analysis now if the bishop takes e5 I think he resigned but um as we saw in this position it's pretty desperate if he does try something like um, king d7 then he's just getting mated in two now so what an amazing demonstration of the king in the center and being exploited with knight sacrifices maybe one of Alexander Belyevsky's immortal games and I'm pretty sure it's one of his favorite tournaments in any case so he might not mind it being called one of his immortals from the Tilburg 1981 tournament which he dominated and he won that tournament okay comments or questions on YouTube thanks very much